I think we'll have to just revert to, yeah, we can't resolve this problem. Okay. It's an honor to read your paper. <laughs> I'm looking Thank forward you. to it very much. That would be most kind, yes. It's technology can be our best friend, but also our worst enemy. <laughs> I think it, it, it feels as though it's the right kind of length for a sort of 40 minute presentation. So, OK, so I will um, begin the paper again. Um, let me put a timer on as well, just so I can make sure I'm keeping track of things. OK, can everyone hear me? OK, so Hinduism. So first of all, we're going to talk about the origins. So the origins of Hinduism are shrouded in mystery. The tradition itself seems to be vaguely aware of this for it describes itself as Sanatana Dharma or an eternal or immemorial tradition. It might be salutary to remember that Hinduism after all is not a Hindu word. It came into currency to represent this tradition about the beginning of the 19th century. The reason for this ambiguity is that Hinduism has no founding figure or founding historical event, nor does it possess a founding text. It is true that in the Rig Veda, we have the earliest literary document of this tradition available to us at the moment, but modern scholars date this text around 1500 BCE, while certain practices within even modern Hinduism, such as the swastika symbol, the mode of greeting, the practice of married women to apply vermilion in the parting of their hair, the sanctity of the people tree, yogic practices and so on, can even be traced to Harappan culture to its mature phase around 3000 BCE. Another feature of Hinduism which contributes to the problem of not being able to determine its origin lies in its plural character. It contains many streams of religiosity, some of which could be ancient, even prehistoric, while others could be relatively modern. OK, it's not double sided. I just had a worry there for a moment. <laughs> so let's have a look at some of the teachings. So it's really difficult to summarize the teachings of Hinduism because it's a plural tradition. Because it is a plural tradition, any statement made about it can, in that sense, be contradicted. Nevertheless, there are certain mainstream concepts and practices which constitute an important part of it. And these are summarized here. So Hinduism believes in an ultimate reality called Brahman which is imminent in the universe, but also transcends it, such as a concept of dignity, such a concept of divinity is often characterized as panentheistic in the literature on the subject to distinguish it from pantheism on the one hand and theism on the other. This reality possesses two modes. So we have Nirgana, Nirguna, without empirical attributes and a Sakguna with empirical attributes. This reality can be expressed both through form and without the use of forms. And this explains the apparent polytheism and idolatry of Hinduism. In view of this, it's very important to emphasize that Hindus believe in only one ultimate reality. One might refer to here to the Hindu doctrine of the Ista Devata or the chosen deity. This refers to a Hindu's birthright to choose any of the many gods and goddesses of Hinduism for his or her private worship with a right also to change it or to worship more than one god or even to worship a divinity that falls outside the Hindu pantheon. Hinduism allows for various ways of realizing this reality. This can be done through spiritual knowledge, devotion, action, and a regimen of spiritual of physical exercises. These various ways of approaching the reality are called yogas in India. Four major yogas were mentioned above but the list is merely illustrative and not exhaustive. The practice of yoga leads to liberation, which raises the question, liberation from what? The most widely accepted answer to this question is that it involves liberation from rebirth. This is the pervasive Hindu belief that human beings are reborn repeatedly in this world in accordance with the moral quality of the actions they have performed on a principle commonly referred to as karma. The mundane world can provide us with moments of happiness, but it cannot provide perfect and permanent happiness, which can only be achieved through encountering the ultimate reality in one way or another. The sacred texts of the Hindu traditions are divided into two categories. So Shruti means revelation or texts that are revealed and Smriti as means tradition. Shruti consists of the Vedas, which are four in number and constitute revelation in Hinduism. 
The literature which falls under the category of tradition consists of the two epics, the Ramayana and the Mahabharata, and especially the Bhagavad Gita. The Bhagavad Gita is part of the Mahabharata, but functions virtually as an independent text on account of the great sanctity attached to it. In it, Hinduism comes closest to possessing a universal scripture. Other forms of traditional literature include the various law books, smritis, and such texts as the Puranas, of which there are 18, and which consist of accounts of the activities of the gods and holy men. There are also holy works which are found in the regional languages, such as Tamil and Hindi. In fact, virtually all of the regional languages of India, and these tend to be subsumed under the heading of traditional literature. So Hindu society is organized along the principles of Varna and Jati. This orientation of Hindu society is often referred to by the term caste, although it is only the latter term, Jati, which properly corresponds to caste in the sense of endogamous, endogamous commensal and craft exclusive social groups. The concept of Varna views Hindu society as consisting of four divisions, Brahmana, Kshatriya, Vaishya and Shudra. To the first category belong the priests, the scholars, the holy men, the intellectuals and so on. To the second category belong warriors, bureaucrats, law enforcement agencies and so on. To the third category belong agriculturalists, artisans, businessmen, business women, entrepreneurs, probably not business women actually, entrepreneurs and so on. And to the fourth category belong members of the labor class and those who perform menial jobs as well. The former untouchables were a subcategory of the fourth varna. The arrangement is hierarchical and is based on the extent of moral and ritual purity associated with the group. In the classical version of the Hindu tradition, the first three classes were called vijas or twice born because they achieved a second birth by undergoing the ritual of being invested with a sacred thread, which entitled them to the study of Vedic text and ritual. And this rite was excluded to shudras and women. This scriptural exclusion, however, does not amount to soteriological exclusion as other means of liberation were available to these groups, but it does constitute a form of discrimination, which is, however, no longer present in modern Hinduism and access to the Vedas is open to all. So the Varnas are four in number, but the Jatis have been estimated to be as many as 8,000 or more and correspond to the term caste. Out of the three features associated with the concept of caste, namely endogamy, commensality, and craft exclusiveness, it is the last one which has proved most vulnerable to modern developments from 1800 onwards. Commensality or the restriction to interdining only among one's own caste members is also fast disappearing, but marriages still tend to be restricted to one's caste, although not always. There is evidence that untouchability has become, became a part of Hinduism by the 6th century BCE, but was formally abolished when the Indian constitution was adopted in 1950. But this does not mean that it's disappeared entirely, but the social and legal climate now works against it. And in fact, there are draconian laws which involve severe punishment for any atrocity, including verbal abuse committed against former untouchables. And this community today is sometimes referred to as Dalit, which means untouchable. And indeed, the former president of India was a member of this group. As mentioned earlier, Shudras and women face discrimination of certain kinds in the history of Hinduism. Since independence, however, India has in place one of the largest affirmative action programs in the world to correct such historical injustices. Some popular practices in Hinduism must be mentioned because they are very visible and widely known. And one of them is the sanctity of the Ganga or Ganges River whose waters are supposed to possess salvic powers, salvific powers. Another is veneration of the cow, which has been part of Hinduism for the past several centuries and continues to be so, largely because the cow tends to be treated as a foster mother due to us being weaned on cow's milk and therefore the consumption of beef is frowned upon by most Hindus. Hindu sacramental life revolves around rites of passage called sanskaras, which convert nature into culture. 16 such rites are well known. The, important, the most important among them, of course, are those around puberty, marriage, and death. Hinduism also sanctifies life through celebration of festivals, the best known of 
the best known of them being the Festival of Lights, properly known as Diwali. The position of women in Hinduism has been widely discussed and much literature on the subject has revolved around the ideas of sati and so on. And many of the disabilities which came to be historically and socially associated with their position over the past few centuries stand legally removed now. And in fa fact, the current president of India is a tribal woman. Women also serve in all the wings of the Indian Armed Forces, in addition to still being part of the political process. Although such issues such as a cultural, so a preference for, for male children and the issue of dowry still needs to be fully addressed. So two points need to be made in this connection. There's very little scriptural resistance to steps taken to redress the condition of women because Hinduism as a plural tradition contains passages which are also positive for women and which can be deployed to improve their condition. In this context, the fact must be highlighted, Hinduism could be the only religion in the world with the ex possible exception of Taoism, which possesses a full-fledged theology as distinguished from theology. That is to say, it contains in the tantric tradition a theological system in which the ultimate reality is a goddess. Although one might wonder to what extent this positive theology translates into practice, there can be little doubt that it creates an ethos which must be considered favourable to women in general. OK, so the next section of the paper is going to uh, look at some statistics. Let me just check the time. OK, so the Pew Research Centre carried out a major survey of religion across India between late 2019 and early 2020, based on nearly 30,000 interviews conducted in 17 languages. The center published its findings in June 2021 under the title, Religion in India, Tolerance and Segregation. Its findings provide a very useful window into the way religions in general, and Hinduism in particular, are practiced in India. So we'll now give um, a summary of these findings. So on the subject of religious freedom, discrimination and communal relations, the study found that people across all the major religious groups in India declared that being a true Indian involved respect of all religions. And we know that acceptance of religious pluralism is a key value within Hinduism. And these findings indicate that in India, tolerance is a religious as well as a civic value. Indians are united in their view that respecting other religions is a very important part of what it means to be a member of their own religious community. The proselytizing religions of Christianity and Islam do not always promote respect for other religions whose members could be targeted for conversion. And this finding seems to suggest that the Hindu attitude in this matter is also close to the Indian attitude. Over 80% of members of all faith groups in India considered respecting all religions an important part of being truly Indian. It is worth noting that 77% of both Hindus and Muslims believe in karma, and that 32% of Christians, along with 81% of Hindus, believe in the purifying powers of the Ganges River. Over 64% of Hindus believe that being Hindu was an important part of being Indian, and 59% thought the same about being able to speak Hindi, although there was considerable regional variation on these points within India. Commitment to these positions was strongest in the central parts of India, and also quite strong in the northern part. Hang on, now I've lost my place. This is what happens when you're not familiar with the text. While it was much, so I'm talking about, yeah, commitment to these positions, while it was much less in eastern, western, southern and northeastern parts of India. A surprising finding of this survey was that 95% of Indians believe that Indian people are not perfect, but Indian culture is superior to others. And this is a quotation from the study. 85% of Muslims also held the same view, even though one in five Muslims said that they had personally faced religious discrimination recently. About 74% of Muslims supported having access to their own religious courts, as opposed to the figure hovering around 30% for other religious communities. So more Muslims, 48%, than Hindus, so it's 37% Hindus, saw partition as a bad thing. 
And more Hindus, so 43%, and fewer Muslims, 30%, saw partition as a good thing. Not surprisingly, two-thirds of Sikhs saw partition as a bad thing. But surprisingly, many Buddhists, so 50%, and Jains, 41%, saw it as a good thing. It's also interesting overall that 41% of the general population thought that partition was a good thing, as against 39% who thought it was a bad thing. So in terms of caste, most Indian adults said that they were a member of a scheduled caste or Dalits. 25% uh, were Dalits, 9% scheduled tribe, or they belonged to other backward classes, 35%, and thus compromised, comprised the majority. But relatively few said they, they saw widespread caste discrimination. So although they belonged to these lower uh, caste groups, the figure being 20% for Dalits, 19% for scheduled tribes, and 16% for other backward class um, group members. Thus, higher rates of discrimination are perceived by members of scheduled castes and tribes, but large majorities of people within them did not feel they faced a lot of discrimination. And religion-wise, Dalits faced most discrimination in the South and the Northeast and least in the West. It'll be interesting to sort of unpack some of the reasons behind um, some of these findings um, from, from the study. Some other interesting findings of this survey were that 64% of Indians considered it very important to marry within their caste, the figure being virtually identical for Dalits and members of the general community. The sentiment was less strong among Buddhists and Christians, although majorities in both these groups were not in favour of people marrying outside their caste. A large majority of Indians, so 70%, said that most of their close friends belonged to the same caste. Indians were opposed to marriages across caste lines as along religious lines. Religious groups showed little change in size to conversion, with more than 50% of conversion of Hindus to Christianity being from scheduled castes and tribes, and mostly in the South. Vast majorities of Indians, so almost 80% across faiths, considered religion as a very important factor in their life, and many considered it important that rites of passage be marked by religious ceremonies. And when it comes to specific practices, about 65% of Hindus had purified themselves by bathing in holy water such as that of the Ganga, and more than 72% had a Tulsi plant, this is a holy, um, it's a type of basil, in, in their homes or their gardens, and surprisingly 72% of Jains also followed this, followed this practice, and about three quarters of Sikhs kept their hair long. Belief in God was mainly universal in India, so 97%, with a figure being higher among Hindus and Christians. It is not surprising that one third of the Buddhists do not believe in God, but what is surprising is that 99% of Jainas believe in God, with a measure of certainty greater than that expressed by any other group. Doctrinal Jainism does not encourage belief in God. However, a Jain saint, when asked whether he believed in God, is said to have responded, when did I say I do not believe in God? Please give me a good reason to believe in God. The Pew Research Center findings on the concept of God in Hinduism are significant. Contrary to the popular impression in the West that Hinduism is polytheistic, very few Hindus, so only 7%, admitted to belief in multiple gods. In fact, 29% of Hindus stated unambiguously that there was only one God but 61% of Hindus espouse the position that there is one God, but with many manifestations. And more than 54% of the Jainas also had the same view. A discussion of Hindu theism is complicated by the doctrine of Ishta Devata, or chosen deity within Hinduism. Sometimes this word is even translated as personal God because it is a God chosen by the devotee as an object of his or her personal devotion. The Pew survey showed 15 images of God on a card to all the Hindus surveyed and asked them to identify the gods that they feel closest to. A vast majority of Hindus, so 84%, selected more than one god or acknowledged that they had many personal gods. This might create the impression again that Hindus are polytheistic, but such is not the case as the report notes that this openness to many personal gods was true not only among Hindus who say they believe in many gods or in one god with man many manifestations, 
but also among those, those who say there is only one God. In terms of the God chosen, the gods chosen, the most commonly chosen God was Shiva, while about one third of all Hindus felt close to Hanuman or Ganesha. There was considerable vari variance in the choice of Ishta Devata. Ganesha was more popular in the West than in the Northeast, and Krishna was more popular in the Northeast, but less so in the South. Among the goddesses, Lakshmi and Kali were the most popular. The case of Lord Rama calls for special comment. He was the chosen deity of 17% of Hindus, and his worship was particularly strong in the central region. The impression that this figure might the impression that this figure might convey could be misleading, because although Rama may not be an object of special personal devotion, the story of Prince Rama as enshrined in the Ramayana enjoys immense popularity throughout India. When a version of it was serialized weekly for a general audience, 96% of all TV sets in India tuned into it. This might explain why the agitation around his birthplace in India became such a major issue. Rama, the hero in Ramayana, is believed by Hindus to have been born in Ayodhya, where according to the Hindu version of events, a temple was destroyed and replaced by a mosque in 1528 in the wake of the Mughal invasion of India by a structure which became known as the Babri Masjid. Centuries of the Hindu struggle to reclaim the site resulted in the demolition of the mosque in 1992 as the legal case struggled through the courts. And finally, in 2019, the Supreme Court handed over the land to the Hindus to build a temple after it was determined through an archaeological survey supervised by the court that the demolished mosque had indeed been built on the top of a pre-existing temple. And the Muslim community was provided with another site to build a new mosque. The findings of the Pew report also call into question, at least for the time being, the so-called secularization thesis. That societies become more secular as they develop economically. When India became independent in 1947, it was amongst the poorest countries in the world, perhaps on account of its colonial past. It has been developing economically since, with the pace of development picking up during the 1990s. And according to the Pew report, despite rapid economic growth, India's population so far shows few, if any, signs of losing its religion. For instance, both the Indian census and the new survey find virtually no growth in the minuscule share of people who claim no religious identity. And religion is prominent in the lives of Indians regardless of their economic status generally. And across the country, there is little difference in personal religious observation between urban and rural residents or between those who are college educated versus those who are not. Overwhelmingly, shares among all these groups say that religion is very important in their lives, that they pray regularly and that they believe in God. And Christians seem to provide an exception to this. The more educated they were, the less likely they were to accord importance to religion in their life. The implication of this situation for the secularization theory should, however, be treated with some caution. First of all, there is some evidence that the perceived importance of religion in the case of any individual declines over a lifetime. Moreover, India is only in the early stage of economic development, and it might be some time before one can confidently claim that the secularization thesis does not work in the case of India. The United States presents an interesting example here. For a long time, it had the highest rates of church attendance in the Western world, but now these are beginning to decline. The attitude of Hindus towards the doctrine of karma and the allied doctrine of incarnation raises interesting philosophical issues. In doctrinal Hinduism, the two doctrines are dovetailed. However, according to the Pew survey, while 77% of Hindus believed in karma, only 40% believed in reincarnation. And this suggests that the vast number of Hindus saw the karmic consequences of one actions manifesting themselves within a single lifetime. Surprisingly, however, 77% of Hindus believed in karma. 73% also believed in fate, 
Although in doctrinal Hinduism, the concept of karma is sometimes used to challenge fatalism. Okay, so the next section is on global and national uh, distribution. We're doing fine for time. So Hinduism is the third mo most widely practiced religion in terms of its membership. It has a global, global following of approximately 1.2 billion members after Christianity and Islam. 95% of all Hindus of the world reside in India, close to 80% of whose population is Hindu. Its global diaspora consists of approximately 20 million followers who have forged close connections with the motherland over the past two decades. The proportion of Hindus as part of the in Indian population has been declining since 1951. There are approximately 3.3 million Hindus in the United States, so about 1% of the population, and approximately 1 million in the UK, so 1.7% of the population, um, about 2.3% of the population in Canada, and 1% of the European Union population is Hindu. Hindu minorities are also found closer to home in Pakistan, Bangladesh, and Sri Lanka, and also across Southeast Asia. So changes over time. The Hindu religious tradition is at least around 5,000 years old, if not older, and has undergone a series of changes which enable its history to be divided into various periods. It is customary to discuss the history of Hinduism in terms of four periods, the Vedic and pre-Vedic, a classical period, a medieval period, and a modern period. The Vedic and pre-Vedic period confronts the historian with a conundrum. Two sets of historical evidence belong to this period, archeological and literary. The archeological evidence reveals the existence of a culture which used to be called the Indus Valley culture and is now preferably referred to as the Harappan culture after its main site. This Harappan culture was contemporaneous with the ancient cultures of Egypt and Mesopotamia, with which it traded and which it far exceeded in size. The material dimension of this culture, the layout of its towns, the structure of its buildings, the diet of its people is now well known to us. Its weights and measures are also well known, but we have no direct access to the mental life of this culture because its script, known as the Indus script, has not yet been deciphered. On the other hand, the other culture known as Vedic culture constitutes a literary document so that the mental life of the people of this culture is very well known to us and has been widely studied, but its material basis still eludes identification. Even the chronological relationship between these two cultures is a matter of acute and even acrimonious debate at the moment. But the general consensus is that Harappan culture preceded Vedic culture. The period of Vedic culture is usually taken to extend from about 1500 BCE to about 400 BCE, and is believed to have been covered by the four divisions of the Vedic corpus into the Samhita, or the Mantra period, the Brahmana period, the Aranyaka period, and the Upanishadic period. By the time we come to the Upanishadic period, the people of this culture who had been recording the evolution of their religious, excuse me, the religious life throughout this period seemed to feel that the religious dynamic had been fulfilled in the Upanishads and the Vedic corpus was therefore closed. This was an informal process in contrast to the more formal manners in which the sacred texts of the Abrahamic religion became to be defined. Major developments were underway within India by the 6th century BCE and these provided a new context for the further development of the Vedic tradition. These were represented not only by new trends within the Vedic tradition, but also by the rise of new religions of Buddhism and Jainism on the religious landscape of India. Classical Hinduism is the name given to this, the evolution of this tradition as it engaged with these new developments and evolved the basic philosophical building blocks of Hindu theology and society. During a period extending roughly from around 400 BCE to around 1200 CE, the next phase in the history of Hinduism, known as the medieval period, represents the encounter of this tradition with Islam. 
as Islam gradually became the dominant political force in the region. And this encounter of Hinduism with Islam was a prolonged one and constitutes the main feature of the medieval period, which came to an end around 1800 CE with the rise of the British rule in India. And lastly, the modern period represents the engagement of Hinduism with the West in the form of British imperialism, Christianity, English education, modern science and technology, democracy, and so on. So we've got two more sections excuse me, left, um, current debates and likely futures. So I will use the expression current debates to discuss developments from within Hinduism from 1947 onwards, after the country gained independence from British rule. One major development around this period was the partition of the country along religious lines into India and Pakistan. As independence approached, Muslim leadership in India began to feel increasingly uncomfortable with the prospect of a sizable Muslim majority, which then constituted nearly 25% of India's population, having to live in the shadow of a Hindu majority and gave rise to two views on Hindu-Muslim relations. One school felt that Hindus and Muslims could live together. After all, they had done so for the past 800 years. But another school felt that once representative democracy had been introduced, the situation changed fundamentally, and it was no longer possible for the two communities to live together. The latter school prevailed, but not wholly. It was able to form a Muslim majority country out of the Muslim majority areas of British India, but this left equally large sections of Muslims within India as there was no transfer of populations at the time of partition. The partition, in a sense, is no longer a matter of current debate, but the situation it created continues to be debated and raises such questions as, if Hindus and Muslims cannot live together, then why are there so many Muslims living in India? If Hindus and Muslims could live together, then what was the need to create Pakistan? Partition did not represent a neat solution of the issue of Hindu-Muslim coexistence, and the issue continues to generate debate. Apart from the Hindu-Muslim issue, another current debate relates to the role of secularism in India, Indian political life. It is significant that when partition took place, it was perceived by the proponents of Pakistan as a division between a Muslim India with Sikh and Hindu minorities and a Hindu India with Muslim minorities. This, however, was not the perception of the Indian National Congress, led by Mahatma Gandhi and Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru, who felt that the division between India and Pakistan was really a division of India between a theocratic state and a secular state. The issue was a significant one. At one time, it was considered settled when the Indian constitution was adopted in 1950 on the basis of a territorial rather than an ideological concept of nationhood. Anything I'm going to say now is going to be controversial because Indian secularism is now a matter of keen contestation in India. And those who favor a secular India regard it as an ideal formulation for a multi-religious, multi-ethnic and multilingual country. But those who are opposed to it highlight the fact that despite the rhetoric, Indian secularism, as it has unfolded in reality, has acquired a pronounced pro-minority and anti-majority character. That is to say, it favours the minorities such as the Muslims and the Christians at the expense of the majority, namely the Hindus. Allegedly, it is this kind of asymmetrical secularism which is responsible for a climate of disenchantment with Indian secularism in vast sections of the majority in India. This development can be debated, but it cannot be denied. It might even be responsible, at least in some measure, for the rise of what is called Hindu nationalism or Hindutva, which has culminated in the rise of the Bharatiya Janata Party to power. It swept the national elections in 2014 and it has been governing India since. What the future holds will become apparent in the summer of 2024, when national elections are next held. So I'm now coming to the final section, which is on likely futures. Academics are not prophets, but they can sometimes anticipate the prospects for the next five or 10 years. 
The future developments in Hinduism are bound to turn on the issue of Hindu nationalism, and there are three possible scenarios. According to one, the country might revert to its original secular stance from which it deviated a decade or two ago if the majority felt that the injustices to which it has allegedly been subject have been addressed. Thank you. <laughs> I hope I'm not coming down with a cold since I got here. <laughs> Thank you, it was very thoughtful. Um, yeah, if they feel that the injustices to which they have been allegedly subject have been addressed, and this is possible, but it seems somewhat unlikely at the moment, a more likely future pertains to whether India will be a de facto Hindu state. What one means by this is that if the demands of the Hindu community are met within the constitutional framework of India, which proclaims India as a secular state, then the secular status of the Indian state would continue to be so. The Hindu demands here pertain to two major issues. The first is a demand for a common civil law which applies to all Indians equally. For instance, at the moment, Muslims in India can have four wives, but Hindus only one. I'm not, I'm not sure which is more desirable. <laughs> um, but the question is not about the morality of monogamy or polygamy, but of all citizens being treated in an equally secular state. The second demand pertains to the abolition of government control of Hindu temples. The various state governments in India can and have taken over a large number of Hindu temples because the Indian constitution allows the government to take over the secular functions of a temple when necessary. This distinction between the secular and religious functions of a temple have, however, been exploited in the view of an increasingly large number of Hindus by a so-called secular government to enrich its coffers and deprive the temples of their financial resources. If the Hindu right continues to secure electoral victories, then it will be very hard for it not to fulfill these demands, which actually can be met within a secular framework. If this happens, then India could continue as a secular state. Its detractors would, of course, say that India really is a de facto Hindu state. If the secular framework is unable to accommodate these demands, then more radical outcomes are likely and may involve the establishment of a Hindu state itself. It's quite complicated, all the twists and turns in this discussion about secularism, so maybe we can return to that later on. The future in this respect would depend a lot on the outcome of the 2024 general national election. So thank you, Professor Sharma, for your for your paper and for um, allowing me to to read it. Uh, I learned learned a lot. So thank you very much. Thank you to you. Today's hero, Federico Squaccini from Chafoscari University in uh, Venice, is going to be our second respondent. Can you can you hear me, Professor Sharma? Yes, I, I can. Yeah. Yes. Um, I'm just adding few considerations after having read and heard uh, so twice uh, your your paper and and um, basically I would like to ask you to make a more explicit statement on the way you deal. Uh, within the paper uh, on the topic of, of Hinduism that you selected as something that we can talk about as a long term, uh, an idea that can be traced back into the, you know, into the history, a way of, uh, you know, the way you describe it is something that we can see on a diachronical, you know, on the long term stuff. So uh, in that sense, because I mean, the conference we have here, uh, even the paper of this afternoon, I, I have been able to follow one on um, uh, other Chinese long term things that we call religions. So I, I think the contribution that, that your paper can add to the conference here is just to make people think about why we have to think of past in order to address present 
and also, as you said in the last portion of the paper, uh, even future to to make forecasting. So we 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 are we are entangled into the idea that there is something there in the past that goes through time, and then it's now here, and then it's going to be there tomorrow. So this is the idea that I get from from your paper. So just just few few things that uh, heading to this three uh, three step. Uh, uh, way of reasoning that your paper invite us to think about, and as far as the past, just make you just, just asking you uh, as far as the past one one things, just one things. I mean the plurality, the plurality within the singularity, you know, the plurality you spoke about and you wrote about uh, pluralism uh, as something embedded within the singularity of the Hinduism that you are talking about. But in that sense, I would like by by I'm a reader of, of uh, your own scholarship since uh, decades now. So I know the many things you have been reading down and especially your book on uh, snake and, uh, you know, the Advaita uh, idea of uh, of uh, having having uh, a snake in front and exchanging for a roof and vice versa. So the idea that plurality and singularity can actually live together peacefully. Uh, the Saguna and Nirguna uh, idea of, of Brahman that we have to translate in something uh, that, that can be that can be reached by by non-Sanskrit speaker. But whatever you're gonna make out of Brahman is one and th that Brahman has a, a, a plurality within. No, the attribution, you, you quote the, the famous way of de describing uh, Brahman could be translated for, for those who are you, for those of you that are more familiar with, uh, with Greek, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with pneuma, something that, you know, expand and grow. You know, the roots of the terms is coming from an Indo-European uh, notion of growing something, something that grows up, like expand. So that idea that to, to, be, to be one, with plurality inside, that that could be the, 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 the character of Hinduism, uh, present many, many problems in history. You know, the, many, the many people debating within India before colonial time on diversity within uh, Veda, within Upanishad, within the same Brahma Sutra. So how you are gonna get us a feeling of the contribution that we can have by thinking to something in the past like Confucianism or Taoism is the same is the same way of reasoning. That, that's why I'm asking uh, if you can say more on on what what this plurality, which is the, the, the definition that you gave us to the singularity of Hinduism, uh, can help or not other people thinking uh, at their own traditional uh, object of, of research. The other one is for the present. The past is gone with the diachronical, but in the present, the, the label the label of Hinduism was used, as you said in your paper, for building a national identity in in the first century. I mean, in, in the first uh, 20th century India, but then now it seems to be uh, an, a label to build a transnational identity. So there is a way of using a label Hinduism. Uh, to build up a national situation with geographical boundaries and political reasoning. And, and then the same label can be used for a transnational identity. So in that sense, if you can add a few things more on why these labels are so powerful that can be used for national goals and for transnational goals. What, what, what is the, the game behind uh, having label in the mind and, and speak about identity in terms of uh, singularity. And the final one is for the future, uh, uh, and, and is precisely related to your own idea, the final portion of the paper on secularism. Well, secularism uh, in, in that sense play the same game that pluralism uh, look like to be you know, the only actor uh, we we all I mean in Italy for example we live in a secular states with a constitution that is claimed to be secular but there is a lot of religious 
things going on within the secular administration that uh, as, as uh, uh, previously uh, Prem Han showed that there is a, a lot of intertwining in between identity in terms of political identity and, and religious identity. Again, secularism seems to be a label precisely uh, equal to Hinduism because it seems to be something that is unique and singular, secularism, that you can export anywhere and you can think about to be a secular guy. But then at the same time, within secularism, there's a large major, a large variety of uh, pluralism that, you know, there is a many things that going on within a, a, a mind that is thinking about himself or herself as a, as a secular, as a secular person, what that means to be tolerant, to accept, to promote, to ignore. So again, even here for the future, uh, if you can say something more on what, what, which kind of secularism are you thinking about when you are you thinking about secularism as something that is going to be uh, postponed by by the new development of Hinduism in India, which is the pluralism that can solve the problem of uh, uh, fractions and uh, and divisions within the singularity of Hinduism, as uh, as uh, Preman Karin also um, presented. These are the main three things that if you can say something more, I think the people here that are not specialists in South Asia can derive uh, something to think about. And thank you very much for your talk. Okay, no problem. Okay, Professor, would you like to begin your response? Okay, can you hear me now? Okay, yes. Okay. I'll let you know. Okay. So my first response is that one should distinguish very clearly between two forms of universalism. Am I audible? Madam President, Chairperson, can you hear me? Can you still not hear? They can hear at the back. Okay, maybe this is about the room as much as anything else. Okay, continue. I'm sorry to interrupt. Okay, give me a minute. I want to try something, okay? Just give me a minute. Tommy, it's better that you know. Tommy, it's better. <laughs> He's trying something. I think he's trying something different just so we can hear his response. But I think it might be the room as much as anything that because they could hear clearer at the back. You go there to the computer because they can follow very well. Yes. No solution. Is this because you're listening to it on your computer? No, no. Oh, in the room. Okay. 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 So Professor Squaccini is just going to the back of the room. To, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So Professor Sharma, continue, please. Okay. My first point has to do with the term universal. I'm going to make two statements. English is a universal language. And the second statement is language is a universal phenomenon. Although we are using the word universal, in both these cases, we are using them in different senses. When we use the word universal in English as a universal language, 
which is taking one thing which is prevalent everywhere. That is, English is known by many people. When we use the expression, language is universal phenomenon, English itself becomes a representative of that larger category. Now, the kind of universalism which we have in Hinduism is of the second kind. And the one we have in the Abrahamic religions is of the first kind. And this is where we get the contrast between the two. So Hinduism has universalism, but it is of a granular kind. The sky is everywhere. It is universal, but it is the same. The earth is everywhere. The earth is universal, but the texture of the earth varies. It's mountains, oceans, and so on. So it is the second kind of universalism which describes Hinduism. The second point I want to make is that sociology can help us in understanding Hinduism and the nature of what is Hinduism. Sociologists distinguish between two kinds of religions. Those religions in which the beliefs and practices of the people come first. And the religion is an expression of the togetherness of the group. Such is the case with the primal religions, with the tribal religions. Second kind of uh, religion is the religion in which beliefs and practices come first and the religious community emerges or coalesces from those people who accept them, as in the case of Christianity and Islam. Hinduism is a religion of the first kind, which we may call communitarian, whereas Western religions are of the second kind, which we may call associational. So Hinduism then becomes the religion of the Hindus. That expression may sound tautological, but it is not in the sense that Hinduism is the sum total of the beliefs and practices of all those people who consider themselves Hindu. Should I continue? Have you have you completed your response or do you need a little bit longer? I'm coming to the third point. Okay, carry on. Yes. We should distinguish between secularism and pluralism. Both secularism and pluralism want to prevent the domination of the public square by a single religion or ideology. But they go about doing this in different ways. Secularism does it by excluding religion from the public square. Pluralism does it by allowing all religions and ideologies an equal place at the table. This is where the emphasis on pluralism in Hinduism becomes relevant. These are the three comments I'd like to offer to Federico. General comments in response to what he said, which I hope will clarify some of the points he raised. Uh, Madam uh, Chairperson, could I say something in response to the remarks made by the first respondent? Yes. 
Yeah, please go ahead. Okay. I'd like to make a couple of responses. The first of which is that one must distinguish between a phenomenon which is pervasive and which is essential. So the question is, is caste pervasive in Hinduism? And is caste essential to Hinduism? I'd like to take the example of the United States here. In the United States, most of the people migrated to it from Europe and they had their own churches. So every American, every white American, will belong to a Christian denomination. Christian denominational, therefore, Christian denominationalism, therefore, is a pervasive feature of American life. But is it, therefore, an essential feature of American life? It is not. Similarly, caste may be a pervasive feature of Hindu life, but it is probably not an essential feature of Hindu life because by the time Hindu, Hinduism arose, caste arose in due course within Hinduism, and not at the very beginning. As is clear from the fact that the Purush Sutra, the first reference to caste belongs to a later period in the Rig Veda. The second point I would like to raise is whether caste has to be considered a Hindu phenomenon or an Indian phenomenon or even a South Asian phenomenon because it is found in all the religions of India. And the third point I would like to make is that the Pew report clearly states that caste discrimination is not a major feature of Hindu social life. Caste segregation may be, but not caste discrimination. That is all that I have to say. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. So, um, I just want to see if there's any questions from, from the audience, if anyone has any questions or comments or, or feedback that they'd like to uh, share. Or is everyone completely worn out after a very long day? <laughs> it's five past seven in the evening here, so I think everyone's looking. We've still got quite a full room, though. So uh, people have stuck around for this final session, but... Uh, I'm not sure there are any questions. Did you want to say anything to finish or? OK, so OK, so um, Professor Sharma, thank you so much for your presentation. And, and, and I'm sorry that you didn't get to present it. <laughs> and, and thank you also to our two respondents. We got there, didn't we? <laughs>